morning. Everybody have a good uh, Thanksgiving. Pretty well, yes. That's good. I haven't had mine yet. I get to have mine tomorrow. <laughs> Welcome, Brother Tyrus. Good to see you on this morning. Tim, good morning. All right, good morning, guys. Um, we've got a good crowd here this morning, and uh, we appreciate everybody being online. And we appreciate those that might watch this after. Um, I'm James, and um, I'm going to I'm going to say I appreciate all the guys who've been stepping in the last few weeks and when I wasn't available or part, only partly available due to other ministry commitments and uh, family commitments. Um, <clears throat> but today we're going to continue in the book uh, from the Promise Builder Study Series, Character Under Construction is the title of the book. And our study for this week is Bothered by Ball Caps. Um, we're going to, this is the, you know, our character is tested in our relationships and the character trait that we're going to talk about being under construction today is giving respect. Um, anybody, uh, well, let me, uh, let me just ask somebody to pray us in and uh, pray for us this morning and we'll continue on. I will. Thank you, sir. Let's pray, Father, you are gracious and loving, Lord, and we come to you humbly asking, Father, for your hand of blessing on this time this morning as we look to be encouraged by your word and to encourage each other from your word. Without your word, we have no power, no strength. Your word is the power for life and godliness, and we thank you, Lord, for the time. We ask you, ask you to do what you will in our hearts and in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Chris. Um, I was just uh, as you were praying, um, I don't know why it came to my, my mind, but um, I just thought maybe we should take a couple minutes and discuss the fatherhood uh, challenge. Uh, we had the fatherhood summit uh, two weeks ago, I think it was yesterday, and then we had a challenge for 14 days. I don't remember if yesterday was day 14 or today is, but um, I think yesterday was. <clears throat> any uh, guys have any feedback on the Fatherhood Summit? Anything really that you got out of it and, or um, ways that we could improve? Everybody's on mute. I will say that at the beginning of the fatherhood challenge, um, I was estranged from my kids for quite a long time. My son was two years before I spoke to him, but we've been back together now for a little over a year. I've been zooming into his uh, church services in Colorado Springs and um, just some good things going on with our relationship there. But I've been praying for the Holy Spirit to help me learn to open up and communicate with my daughter and uh that's been my whole prayer through the entire fatherhood summit so uh, yesterday i sent my daughter a text as i usually do on holidays and most of the time i'll get a brief response from her so i sent her a happy thanksgiving and hope she has a wonderful day and she came back with a text that said you know i'd really like to hear from you on some days other than on holidays so that was the holy spirit's way of telling me that my daughter wanted to talk to me and so i assured her that she would hear from her father before christmas and uh so we've actually been texting back and forth since yesterday about different things going on in our lives and i just thank god for that 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 communication is being reopened that's awesome. God can create all things and he can restore all things. Huh? Yeah. That is, um, that is an awesome answer to prayer. Good. Anybody else have anything they want to talk about with regard to fatherhood summit or challenge? 
Okay, well, if you think of something else, we'll talk about it whenever, whenever it pops up, whenever the Holy Spirit brings it up again today, I guess, or whenever. <clears throat> I know it's convicted me on a few things uh, as well. Some of the challenges were you know, really took, really were challenging as far as time goes. We've got, you know, a lot of us, most of us have so much else going on, but, you know, some of them, one of them, I think it was day seven or something like that. There were like four hours of bonus material <laughs> that went on. If you listen to all the, uh, I think it was Focus on the Family podcasts uh, for that day, but it was a really good one. Uh, dealt with uh, adult children and things like that. So uh, it's definitely one that I listen to most of those uh, podcasts, see what I've done wrong, what I could do better. Um, yeah. I just feel like so, I need to add to that, James, even though it's kind of off topic for your study today. Um, but my wife and I have been discussing this lately that 22 years ago when we started parenting, we thought, A, we were really well prepared to be parents. And B, that the hardest years were the young years. And we were basically, you know, 50% wrong on the first bullet point and about 150% wrong on the second bullet point. Um, and now that we have children that are 22, 21, 19, two 18 year olds, and then two more teenagers, we're finding out that there's this really well known but unspoken truth that parenting adult children is one you're never done until you're dead and two it's it's a mental long game it's uh it's hard and we're we're learning that and yeah so anyway if any of you are in that phase where you feel like you're the only person struggling to parent adult children then, then that's just a word to say no we were we're with you. Amen to that. Amen. Amen. Tom is laughing, I saw. So he's got some something he'll share with us when he's ready. Uh, too. Yeah. Yeah. And Jonathan says in the chat, there's a lot of good prayers, um, practical advice. So, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, I think one of the reasons I bring that up is because giving respect to the you know, the trait that we're talking about today is, um, I guess I, I took a group, I, I probably have told this in, in here before, but um, I took a group of four kids on a mission trip uh, when they were in middle school. So I, would, I didn't have a child yet. Uh, this is one of those things in 1995 that, that happened that year. And I had no idea what I was doing with these kids or how I was supposed to lead them or, or what I was supposed to teach them. But um, somehow this song got stuck. I don't know if I picked it or the kids picked it, but a song got stuck in, um, in our minds, in our heads, in our hearts, I think. And it was uh, Aretha Franklin's R-E-S-P-E-C-T, Respect. Well, um, we sang that song all the way there, all through the week, all the way back. And it was a, such an awesome week, just because, I think partly because, we respected each other. We respected God. We respected where he had us that week. And um, when my kids got old enough to talk or talk back, um, I, only have, I only have one rule in our house. Uh, I tried to simplify things and I thought I was being wise or whatever, but it's respect one another. And you can't imagine all the things that come from that one word, especially when you're raising children or even adult children um, when we forget. And they, you know, when they got older, they would remind me uh, of how to speak to my wife, and how to speak to them and to other people, um, because sometimes I just don't come across as respectful and probably am not uh, because I'm irritated or something and don't mean to. But anyway, um, that's one way I can tie this into this, uh, the fatherhood and, and today's 
uh, study, Chris. But um, as a warm up for today and for this this uh, week's study, uh, playing the national anthem is an important opportunity for fans to show respect for our nation and her flag. The row of high school boys standing in up uh, standing in front of you do not remove their ball caps, and this bothers you. What would you do in this situation? Well, I know for me, you know, being in the military that, um, you know, we were trained, right? Um, you know, we had, if you weren't in uniform, you had to remove your hat. If you were in uniform, you had to be, you know, saluting. Um, that was the way it was. But in that situation, I've actually been in that situation and sometimes I've gotten distracted or whatever, and I haven't removed my hat. But as soon as I realize it, I, oh, immediately. Um, and a lot of times what I have is somebody nudges me or uh, gets my attention about it. But I can think of some cocky little um, punk high school boys that, you know, would probably get a little, um, be a little belligerent about it. So I don't know. I mean, it, it's, uh, I would definitely point it out that, hey, you're supposed to take your hat off because I've done that. Um, doesn't mean that they're going to take their hat off. Right. Just would hope that they would be convicted enough to uh, do it. But we've seen the exact opposite in the media over the past, I don't know, five, five years or so going anywhere from Colin Kaepernick to, I don't know, it, you name them, right? There's been tons of them out there. Refuse to stand for it, refuse to respect. So, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I know I've been going to a lot of my daughter's football games. I went to a lot of my son's um, football games in college. And um, just the last, I think of the last game I went to, I was, uh, I was, you know, recording her dance, which is right before the national anthem or the national anthem is played in the middle of that. And I was recording her and got time for the national anthem and uh you know some other song was was uh, finishing up and the, the announcer says please you know remain standing and remove your hat well i didn't remove my hat immediately because i was taught to remove your hat when the, and and salute actually uh when the music starts right so some guy goes remove your hat remove your hat and i'm like you know i didn't i didn't acknowledge him i didn't say anything i just you know and the music started, I removed my hat, and I saluted. And you're supposed to, and most people put their hand over their heart. I salute when, um, when the national anthem is played. Because I, I was taught how, and I was told how, and, and um, that was, that's, as a, as a, I think as any veteran, but certainly as a retiree, I'm, I'm like, I'm very proud of uh, serving my country. And oh, by the way, you know, my, my response to this question is, you know, I've, I've been in war zones. I've been in uh, places, and a lot of you guys have too, but um, I fought for the right for you to make your choice. And if somebody doesn't stand for the national anthem, as has been you know, the case in the last few years, or they, you know, that seems disres disrespectful to me, to all the um, military that are serving and, uh, and have served, that it's it's really we we fought for the for the right uh for freedom and um it hurts uh when people don't when people disrespect the flag but you know i just don't think we should i, don't, I think we should say something and then leave it at that and you know we we do we do uh fight for freedom of of our of speech of freedom of expression um, in our country. So that's my take. Well, I've Anybody thought, else? I've, I've, I've thought about just asking those people like that, you know, are you doing it intentionally 
um, if you intentionally are doing it because you are just wanting to show disrespect for the flag, where do you want to go? I will start a GoFundMe so that I can get you a damn ticket and you can get out of this country. You don't like this country? Why are you here? We don't want you here if you don't like this country. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of those emotions, I, you know, went through me too during that, that whole time from when Colin Kaepernick started the kneeling thing. And, and I think some people are still doing it this year. Um, I never had a, a problem, fewer. you know, you know, that, that's something that I never had a problem with him kneeling. I never, ever had a problem with him kneeling, but not during the anthem. You, right. you know, you want your platform fine. I'm sure the NFL would be very happy to give you 30 minutes, 60 seconds of you going out there with your fist up and while you're on your knee, you know, go do that, but not during the anthem. When the anthem plays, you stand up and you respect the black. All right. It's done yeah. nothing, done nothing but damage this country. Yeah. It's a very divisive thing. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so we'll go on to our study. Uh, this is a very important and uh, near and dear to my heart topic about the flag and and showing respect, as you guys can can uh, probably have seen or heard already today. That's why <laughs> but, I'm uh, comments this morning. <laughs> I guess I guess it might be kind of near and dear to my heart as well, James. <laughs> um. Uh, so if somebody would be ready and prepared to read uh, in Ruth chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 16, I'd appreciate it. We'll, I'll read the, the background to get us started. So in our previous um, study last week, um, we followed Ruth and Naomi out of the land of Moab to Israel. Ruth's character revealed strong commitment in a challenging in-law relationship. In this week's study, we, we see another facet of her character under construction. In the setting of her rural workplace, Ruth will model for us as men a rare respect for the one who gave her working privileges. If somebody is ready to read, that'd be great. Yeah, I'll get to it for you. There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. So Ruth and the Moabites said to Naomi, please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I might find favor. And she said to her, go my daughter. Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, It is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And, he, and she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. Then Boaz said to Ruth, you will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground and said to him, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? And Boaz answered and said to her, it has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and have come to a people where you did not know before. The Lord repay your work and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. Then she said, let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed parched grain to her 
and she ate and was satisfied and kept some back. And when she arose up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. Also let the grain from the bundles fall from her uh, purposely for her. Leave it that she may glean, and do not rebuke her. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> All right, so um, the questions for interaction this week, um, we do put those in the PK app and on a daily basis and uh, try to spread them out throughout the week. But uh, question one for this week is, uh, in what ways did Ruth show respect for Naomi? And why do you think she related to her mother-in-law this way? Anybody? She wanted to show respect and and help feed, right? Help take yeah. care of the two of them, right? It's one thing. Yeah, Jonathan said it was because it was her character in the chat mm -hmm. there. I, I mean, it just, yes. I mean, that's what I got from it was that, you know, none of, they didn't have husbands anymore, right? Uh, nobody to take care of them. So Ruth was like, I will go and gather what little grain I can that's left behind to help feed us and support us. Why did she, I mean, if we look at the story from last week, why did, you know, why did she, why do you think she related to her mother-in-law in this way? She said, you know, that uh, last week in, in our study, she said that um, she would follow her and her God would be, you know, you know, Naomi's God would now be her God. It was, it was all, it's all based on that, in my mind. Yeah, not only did she respect her mother-in-law, she respected her mother-in-law's God, right? Which yeah. the Moabites didn't really know about, uh, except through a person, um, you know, through any Israelites like Naomi and her husband who had come uh, from Israel. All right. Um, she loved her too, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So love and respect, uh, they do usually go uh, hand in hand. Um, in Tyrus and Tim, if you guys have anything to throw in, please come off mute and, and join, join in the conversation. We don't let us uh, completely monopolize the, the, the talking here. But if you yeah, the, other, the other thing I see in that scripture is I'm, as I'm looking back at it, in, in um, verse 2, she says, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain left behind um, in anyone's eyes whose eyes I find favor. She And then in and then the Naomi said, go ahead, my daughter. She asked permission to do it. That's, that's what's interesting. Also, she asked her mother, which is a sign of her, you know, her mother-in-law, which is a sign of respect as well. And not only did she ask Naomi to go when she got to the fields, instead of just going in and starting to pick up stuff, she asked the, uh, the if it was all right, the, the people man, that were doing the harvest, right? <laughs> Yeah, is it, is it okay if I do this? Yeah. Yeah, and there, um, I remember, you know, reading study materials for this in the past where uh, there's a there's a, a pecking order, right? And you see that in this, uh, in this uh, passage, right? <clears throat> there's a pecking order. There's the men who are going to do the, bulk of gathering right and then there's uh some that come up behind them and then there's people like naomi who are just kind of um they're there to glean whatever might be left on the ground 
you know, whether, I don't know if it's whether individual grain or, um, or ears, like, like they started to leave at the end of this passage, right? Or were asked to go ahead and leave some at the end of this passage, full ears of, of grain. But, um, yeah, she respected that, that, uh, that, that pecking order. She knew about it somehow. And Naomi probably helped her uh, along and helped her understand that. Um, how can we tell that Ruth um, felt deep respect for Naomi's people? What were the benefits to Ruth of showing respect to Boaz? I think the same thing that what we were talking about, they're kind of that pecking order. Um, and actually, no, Naomi, you know, called herself a servant um, in the scripture as well, you know, so that I am not like one of your maid servants, but I am a servant. Um, thank you for showing me kindness. She was just, a, seemed to be a very um, respectful young lady. How do you think that Ruth wound up in the field of Boaz, who was from the clan of her father-in-law, Elimelech? Uh, El, Eli might have a hard time saying it. Elimelech. Uh, <laughs> Elimelech. And, and I, Elimelech. Believe, yeah, Elimelech. I believe a lot of that is what we call a God encounter. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, they're all around us when we look for them. And for the simple fact that they needed food and it was obviously close by where they lived and to go there and then to find out that um, that person was actually a close relative of her father-in-law. She already had the respect for Naomi uh, because we don't really know the life of uh, Ruth and Orpah. We don't really know what their home life was like before Elimelech and Naomi showed up with their sons. And um, so, you know, Orpah decided to stay back. Uh, Ruth decided to come on. So obviously, um, like we said earlier, she had, she wanted to trust in the God that she saw them worshiping. And so to come there, it, it had to basically, I believe, be led by God to, to put her into that particular situation. Well, the other part of the the uh, tradition or um, or their ways, their culture was that uh, when a husband died, a brother was supposed to step in for him, and basically, um, the wife became his wife, the 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 living brother's wife. Well, now in this case, both uh, of them had passed away, the father-in-law had passed away, so Naomi didn't have, so she was respecting that culture of the people as well, knowing somehow um, that she was in Boaz's field, and certainly when Boaz showed up, um, and uh, he was so kind, right? Um, what were the, so what were the benefits to Ruth of showing respect to Boaz? We don't really get into it in this passage, but um, but some of us read ahead and <clears throat> and and or know the story. But um, Boaz was not the next in line either. No, but, but let me tell you this: that okay. So Boaz was a member of Elimelech's clan. Okay, so. What were the benefits to Ruth of showing respect to him? Well, I don't know. I mean, it seems kind of obvious to me. I know you say that it doesn't really go into it, but we see. So how did, I mean, he showed respect. I mean, I believe Ruth showed respect to Boaz just by being out there doing what she was doing for Ruth, right? Mm -hmm. Boaz respected that. What did he say? I've told my men not to touch you. I have said, go drink from the, this well where the men have drawn this water told you to rest here. I've told you to follow behind. And at the end of that, he said, I've told them to leave piles for you. I've told them to leave grain for you, ungleaned, so that you can collect it. 
So, I mean, that were the benefits of Ruth showing that respect to Boaz. Yeah, without going ahead to probably what's next week's lesson, if we look, uh, and you did a good job there on that too, Chris. Um, um, I believe that um, looking at the benefits in chapter two is just the simple fact that they needed grain. They needed grain. And Ruth's being humble and going and asking to be able to glean the fields and stuff like that. And then Boaz returning and finding out that, oh, hey, this is, uh, you know, this is um, Naomi's daughter-in-law here. Um, and out of respect of Elimelech, Boaz then was treating her kindly uh, to help Naomi out. And I'm quite sure of that. So just her respect and honor of, um, you know, the courtesies of I, I need to get grain and, and I want to show respect for those that I'm gathering it from um, brought her all kinds of benefits. She was able to sit down and eat bread and dip it in the vinegar with him. You know, she got a meal out of it. Plus, uh, just then, then ask her to, you know, he, he said that she could glean with the women that were there instead of having to pick up behind them. So there's a lot of benefits she got out of in this chapter alone, uh, just by her respect and, and the character that she carried. Yeah, her servant heart, right? Um, obviously, Boaz was impressed by, by Ruth, what likely contributed to this. Well, it was her heart, her servant heart. Um, uh, it, I guess what I was getting to, Chris, was, uh, and you're, you're absolutely right. It does say, those, it does, you know, allude to those things and talk about those things here in this part, in this passage. But um, there was this, there's also part of their culture was this idea of a guardian redeemer, right? They didn't have Jesus yet, right? They didn't, they didn't know about Jesus uh, as a redeemer, right? So they had this concept of, of, you know, like I said, the brother, the living, a living brother would, would then take um, the, the, the dead brother's wife as his wife. Um, but that went all the way down the line um, in any uh, relation, anybody who's related to them um, could do that, could be a redeemer. And in this case, uh, Boaz was not the immediate um, person in the lineage. And they found out you know, later in this chapter, I think, or, or the next chapter that, uh, he, you know, there was somebody else that was closer in blood relations to uh, uh, Elimelech and 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 the two um, the two brothers who passed away. So uh, they had to go to go to that person and and, uh, and and Boaz, the person found out he didn't really want to take Ruth as a as a wife. So Boaz did that, and Boaz, I'm pretty sure, was not married. So. Uh, he was able to, um, he was able to do that and all be with all, all be within the culture, right? So, um, but the things I think that really impressed Boaz was, was her, her servant heart, her love for her uh, mother-in-law, uh, even over her own family, her own mother in, in, in Moab and father in Moab. Anything else that you guys can see or think of that um, contributed to the impression that Ruth left? Okay. Um, well, in, in so in this rural workplace of that day, women were commonly mistreated. Often our places of work are not much different. Why is that, you think? Naomi was very aware, and Boaz was obviously very aware and um, of of telling his men to ex to uh, accept her, don't lay a hand on her, don't mistreat her, don't abuse her, right? Don't go out and rape her, uh, which I think was probably the the case in a lot of these kinds of situations when somebody wasn't part of their pack already which Boaz obviously knew all his people that were in the field because he greeted them, they loved him, 
They knew he was a respectful and, and loving master and they wanted to be there as his, uh, as serving him, right? And in this case, Ruth did as well. So, you know, bring that to today's workplaces. Um, I asked my wife, she would say, because of misogyny and a patriarchal society and a patriarchal um, way of, you know, just the way that things have been throughout history. Um, and yes, uh, Ruth was a foreigner. It says that in the scripture. So, yeah, um, I don't know whether that was so much if um, a wom another woman from a different clan that was from Israel would have come down there if they would have done that to her. I don't know that, but apparently, uh, at least with uh, foreigners, that was something that probably happened. I meant to do this this week, but where is Moab? Um, isn't it south of Judah? I really don't. It's right, across, I, I it's, right across, it's right across the river. Okay, I didn't. I didn't uh, look it up, but yeah, she probably looked different. I guess uh, what was was a point. So, uh, why is it? Moab is east of the Dead Sea, south of the territorial yes. of Reuben. Yep. Okay. Thank you. I had to go grab another reference myself. Good job, Mr. Fisher. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Moab. Uh, Judah. Moab. Um, you know, I think this particular question, James, we could go to, uh, we could kind of like uh, shift gears over to Tony Evans there when he's talking about kingdom men. I think that's uh, one of the biggest reasons our workplaces today um, may exhibit some of these traits of women not being treated properly is because we don't have enough kingdom men in this world that understand uh, the relationship that we should have with the women in our lives. Um, all, the, uh, all the men always want to look to the verse that says, wives submit to your husbands, and they, they forget that there's a, the, another verse right after it says, husbands submit to your wives. You know, we're, we're supposed to... Uh, well, it's wives, it's wives submit to your husbands as, as is fitting to the Lord. Well, absolutely. You know, not not just submit to your husbands just because it's as is fitting to the Lord. You know, right. That, just that's, that verse. That's exactly my point. But there's a lot of men don't understand that. Some of them don't even know the verse, but they still live by the women are supposed to submit to them idea just because, you know, for so many years, uh, our the generations before us, women didn't have a voice. You know, they were they were at the house. They were cleaning the house and taking care of the kids and cooking the meals for everyone. Um, they had a voice, but not outside the house, basically. Um, so uh, a lot of it just has to come down with our our respect of being godly men and understanding what a woman's role in our life is, regardless of whether it's a coworker or a, a spouse. So, so in so you know, obviously these books are from the '90s. So, 25 years ago, have we come? Have we come? Is any, is anything any different in our workplaces today than it was even 25 years ago when this book was written? And when they probably, you know, I think they they felt that women hadn't quite earned that equality uh, status in the workplace at that point is maybe one of the reasons for this question. And I don't know today. Um, I know in the workplaces that I worked in and, um, you know, government workplaces and contractors working for the government, um, I think they have, women have come a long way in the 25 years, the 20 some odd years that I was in the military and 10, I guess, 15 years after that. So it'd be 35 years. They've, they've certainly come a long way from being just the secretaries to way more than 50% of the time being the bosses, yeah. the, the senior management. Um, so hopefully we've done some good here. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it's part, yeah, I think that patriarchal society is that, that concept, that attitude, God didn't mean it to be a bad thing. Right. No. <laughs> he he did. I do do think he built us, created us as men 
to be protectors, uh, but he, he made um, you know, he made Eve as a helpmate, not as um, you know. In in a lot of ways, he made women stronger than men. Um, certainly in longevity and through childbirth, I don't think that's something I could ever do. I've I've passed a uh, a kidney stone, and that was that was more that wasn't even close, probably to what childbirth is. But it it's the closest thing I think we as men um, can can have to go through, but um, it's not even close to childbirth, I don't believe. Uh, but I don't know. Um, I guess that no, my think, question think, to add think, on to this is, is it, have, we, have we become any better? Is our society as a whole changed uh, much at all? I think it's, if anything, yes, it absolutely has changed. But actually, I think it's maybe gone the other way. The pendulum has, pendulum has swung to the other side. And now we seem to have a lot of movements to put men down, you know, toxic masculinity. We hear these things. Um, it seems like that it's not so much, um, now it doesn't seem like it's so much for the women to be equal as they want to be in control. You know, that's kind of my point of view of it. That's what I see happening right now. Well, as we've seen also in the last, um, you know, I, I look on the screen here, and at least the guys on camera are, are white, male, um, and, and you know, we've seen over the last couple of years that uh, something I thought was gone, being in, the, being in this sort of D.C. area and understanding and working with, with uh, people of all races in, uh, in ministry and in the military, I just thought that that was that that whole idea of oppression was gone in our society or not gone, but certainly in a lot better situation than it, than it must be according to some, a lot of these people uh, that were rioting in the streets in their minds, uh, they're still oppressed. And uh, we have to, we have to try to understand that and try to, you know, uh, be godly to them, I think. Um, and being godly is, in my opinion, uh, God is, <laughs> I learned this from a pastor a while back too, God is bigger than gender. He's bigger than race. He, he is, you know, of all races. He didn't start the race thing, as uh, Dr. Alveda King uh, likes to say. He didn't divide us into race. He made us different colors to try to get us to, to, to get along and, and, get, um, and love one another. Uh, we're all of the human race. And yes, there are different colors in that human race. Uh, but anyway, um, hopefully we've come a little ways, especially in our attitudes uh, here uh, in Promise Keepers and uh, in our, our ministry here together, our work together uh, with you guys that um, you know, we, I do believe we respect one another. And, um, and I'm thankful to God that he teaches us how to do that. It makes me think back to... Um, um to David and whenever he was sent when I think it was um, I can't remember what prophet it was that went and anointed David but do you remember what God told him he says don't look at the man based on his appearance he says I see his heart and that's the way I try to see people I try to look at people I don't look at people and judge them by the way that they look I base I judge them and I'm really trying to judge anybody at all, but I take people based on their character, what they do, stuff like that. That's more, you know, to me, the way that you treat people, you know, you can tell a lot about a man by the way he treats his mother. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what? And, I that, and that, and that, and that tells you a lot about that man, that man's dad, because how he treats his mother was what he was taught. Right. Go ahead, Carl. Sorry. That's okay. I was going to say what I see happening is, um, I don't know why I got Tony on my mind this morning, but he goes back to, to the men not stepping up and doing what they're supposed to be doing. You guys, and, and the way, the way the evil one has, um, skewed the whole, what a, what a man and woman are supposed to be together. 
and and a man's masculinity and the whole things like that uh, men are not stepping up to the job of being the people that they're supposed to be and, and I know, I know most of you have probably heard Tony Evans' broken man theory from starting in the home. If you're a broken man, you, you're gonna have a broken home and that contributes to the community and to the state and to the, <laughs> to the world, you know, all the way up. Um, I think a lot of this has to do um, with men in general have become lazy. They've lost their values. Uh, women are tired of it. And so they need something to do. And, and I believe, you know, um, when God created Adam and he said, yeah, he, he's got to have somebody to help him, um, because, um, we can't do this alone and we can't think that we're all high and mighty and, and, and try to rule over everything either. We're, we're to be patriarchs and that, and that is not a, that's not a rulership title patriarch is someone that actually comes alongside it almost kind of goes along with paraclete which is the the word they use for the holy spirit we're supposed to come alongside each other and support each other and that's the way it should be in the workplace as well you know um just because i've got um eight engineers under me at the moment doesn't mean i am their master by any means i i should be serving them to make sure that they can do the things that they need and, and have the things that they need to do their job. Uh, so it's all a mindset that has really gotten skewed. Um, that's the whole spiritual warfare thing of it. Satan knew if he could bring the men down, he could take the whole family. Equally yoked. Equally yoked. It's absolutely. Gonna, you know, you have two oxen pulling a, pulling a plow. If one of them jumps on the back of the other one and expects it to pull the plow and him, <laughs> probably going to take a lot longer if you know and not going to work out so well <laughs> yeah so um another thing that ruth did was um and and and, and this happens a lot of times in workplace is that when workers are genuinely respectful and quick to serve uh, they're sometimes taken advantage of how have you seen this demonstrated in the workplace? Well, I have to be careful of that myself as a manager because I got a couple of golden employees that I know if I ask them to do anything, they, they get it done very quickly. But I also have to remember that the other people that are there need the opportunity to shine. They need the opportunity to be tested. So, yeah, it can become very easy for you to rely on someone that you know is going to get the job done. Uh, quickly and efficiently, but you also have to be mindful of what your purpose is there, and that's to build a stronger organization. Yeah, I just, I agree with Carl with that aspect of things, you know, that sometimes we abuse those um, that we appreciate the most. They get the biggest part of the abuse, or at least what they would consider abuse. You, you can show it as a, you're showing it. I mean, I think generally you're probably showing it as a sign of respect because you know, Carl, that those people will get the job done for you. And sometimes there's those situations where it's just like, you know, I have to get this done. I'm going to this person because I know they can get it done for me. Um, but in those situations, like what you're talking about, everybody else needs that opportunity to step up and be part of the team, right? It's a, uh, but if somebody's disrespectful to you all the time, I know what I'm doing. I'm going to somebody else and I'm going to try to get that person fired, you know, because they're disrespectful. It's like, no, you know, you have to uh, treat others as you want to be, you know, as, as you want to be treated. Right. Um, and I try to, I try to do that and I try to live that way, but that's not always reciprocal. Yeah. When, when people are not respectful, it just makes living with them or um, working with them so much harder, right? Um, yeah, I think of the... And, uh, and people that are, yeah. on the other hand, if, when people are uh, servant-like or quick to serve, um, a lot of times they're looked on as being weak or, you know, they just, they're just looked on negatively a lot of times instead of, you know, the positive that that should be um certainly if it's 
certainly if they're servant leaders, right? Um, <clears throat> well, you see, if you think about the parable of the uh, uh, the harvesters, right, where he went in the morning and he gathered, you know, got a bunch of men to come to the field and he agreed to pay them all a penny, right, to come and harvest. Um, and then he went back at noon and he got some more. And he agreed to pay them a penny. And then he went at four o'clock in the afternoon, one hour before quitting time, and he gathered more and he agreed to pay them a penny. But what happened? The ones that were there from eight o'clock in the morning, those are the ones that we're talking about here. Those are the ones that were respectful and quick to serve. And what happened though? They got a little bit hurt. Their feelings were hurt because the person that got there at four o'clock got the same penny that they did, right? So that's kind of that mentality. That's kind of the example of what can happen to somebody that's quick to serve if you take advantage of them all the time. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> while we're getting close to our time, <clears throat> so uh, as wrap up, um, our, in our hard hat area, the quote for this week, um, respect generally comes to those who deserve it, not to those who demand it, uh, by Paul Kroger. A respectful spirit is highly valued as an, in an employee. Um, how might we spot this character quality in someone before we hire them? Did they take their baseball cap off when they entered the building? You know, did they uh, hold the door open for a lady? Did they um, approach, approach you and shake, you know, shake your hand, introduce themselves? You know, there's lots of things that you can look at with the way that somebody holds themselves. And are they... You know, what are they doing as you approach them? I mean, are they sitting there, you know, speaking badly? Or are they sitting there, you know, having a good conversation? There's lots of things that you can see about somebody. Like I said, pay attention to how somebody treats their mom and you'll figure out whether, you know, whether the, how they were raised. Yeah. So basically they're giving respect, which is our yeah. character under, um, or trait <laughs> under construction this this week. <clears throat> um, you know, respectful, respect is, being respectful is very, um, very evident, usually. <clears throat> um, but sometimes, you know, sometimes you think about it, sometimes people fake that, right? So how do you get through the fake respect just because, hey, I'm in an interview or, um, you know, sometimes you've met these people before and maybe they weren't respectful so um you know there's you know it, it takes time so it takes time sometimes to get get through that um but because this is one that it can be can be genuine or maybe not so genuine uh sometimes, actions, but actions yeah. speak actions speak louder than words right yeah 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 absolutely all right. So, um, in our for our prayer time, I'll remind us that um, you know we we have this mantra of spending one minute praying silently about today's study, about the study this week. Uh, two minutes express thanks to God together, um, and then three minutes to write in a prayer journal sometime this week, and uh, four minutes to pray for each other. So hopefully we'll have four minutes to do that. I'll read my response as a promise keeper. Number one is I will keep, I will seek to demonstrate my respect for those around me by blank. And number two, I will encourage those who are respectful and quick to serve by blank. So fill in the blank. Um, maybe, you know, again, I suggest if you can get into the go into the app and um, maybe maybe just say hey I want to respect those around me by whatever this week give some give some suggestions uh, help others in uh, in and through the app or, or uh, just do it <laughs> as your response right uh, in your home and your workplace so um, 
with that, let's let's go to the Lord in prayer. And um, as uh, we want to welcome um, you guys, uh, Tim, you're on often. Thank you. And Tyrus, I believe this is the first time I've been on that you've been on. So welcome you. And um, and uh, feel free to pray if you want or um, if uh, if anybody else wants to pray, um, then do that. Uh, Chris, can I, uh, Chris Henderson, can I ask you to uh, pray us out today? Yeah. Sure. Heavenly Father, I just want to come to you and give you thanks this morning for this wonderful group of men and giving us the opportunity to come together and dive into your word and let it reach out and touch us and, and give us this understanding as I was reading those, what my response as a promise keeper is. I was two things that come to me in those, what I will seek to demonstrate my respect for those around me by, and I will encourage those who are respectful and quick to serve by. And the only things I could come, the things that come to my heart is acknowledgement and encouragement. Um, those two things right there is how we can show people that we see what they're doing. And I know that that's exactly what we want in our lives. Lord, we want you to show us, acknowledge us and encourage us and show us that, um, that you know that we're doing, that we're trying to be your humble servants, Lord, and that we're trying to come to you and learn and be better men. And this is what, this is what it's about, this brothership, this fellowship, this is what it's about is coming together as different individuals, different people that we're each and every one of us are different, just like Ruth was different from the people that she was with there. But she gained a lot of respect from Moab in this situation, Lord, and, um, and gained favor from him. And there's a, there's a very wonderful story in this uh, little study that we did today. And thank you for that opportunity, Lord. Lord, I just pray for all of my brothers to have a blessed uh, rest of their weekend and pray for uh, each of us to go and be the church and just continue to show encouragement to others, lift people up wherever we can, Lord. I just pray all of this in your mighty name. Amen. 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 Well, thank you guys. Um, I do uh, hope all of you do have a wonderful week and uh, yes, let's go and be the church. Amen, brothers. Love you guys. Love you Amen. guys. Have, have a good Amen. week. Yep. Blessings.